Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, this is Increase Access, Decrease Costs, Transitioning Your Course Materials uh, to No Cost. You're transitioning your courses to no cost materials. So I'm Larissa Garcia. I am the information literacy librarian and the subject specialist for the School of Art and Design, the School of Family and Consumer Sciences, and the Nutrition and Dietetics program. And I'm going to let Deanna introduce herself. Hi, everybody. I'm Deanna Ferris. I am the um, subject specialist librarian for history, psychology, leadership, educational psychology and foundations, um, women and gender studies, and also the curator of juvenile literature, as well as working on open educational resources and textbook affordability. So Deanna and I are members of the Course Materials Affordability Task Force, and so is Tracy as well. Uh, the group began as a collaboration between university libraries and the Center for Teaching and Learning, but it now is comprised of staff, faculty, and administrators from across campus. And our main goal is to increase access to learning and reduce equity gaps by increasing the number of NIU courses that use no or low cost um, course materials. So to achieve this, we are um, trying to encourage faculty to use free and low cost course materials by providing information, training and support, which is why we are having this workshop and we are offering it about twice a semester so far. So because it's such a small group, um, we have a presentation prepared and an activity planned, but we also thought that we could try to frame this as more of a conversation or a discussion. So instead of session outcomes, um, we thought we'd share our session topics. Um, and then we hope that you'll share your experiences or your concerns, ask questions um, throughout our, we'll have pauses built in um, throughout the presentation. So these are some of the topics that we'll be talking about. Course materials affordability at NIU. Um, some of the perceived barriers that faculty have when transitioning to OER, finding relevant disciplinary no-cost materials, and then we'd really like to hear from you what kind of support or resources you'd like to see or you'd like to have um, to, that would help you transition to low or zero-cost course materials. And so to kind of to get things started off, um, obviously there is a certain amount of this that is sort of presentation, um, but since we're such a small group, as Larissa pointed out, we really want to just kind of tailor things as much as possible to your particular needs and to your kind of um, experience level, comfort level um, with what we're talking about today. Um, so if you are comfortable um, unmuting, um, we're happy to, to, to hear your voice, um, or if you want to put something then in the chat, but Basically, we kind of want to know about what made you register for this session? What was it that kind of brought you here today? Um, and then a kind of related question is, um, how much do you already know about open educational resources or no and low cost resources? And so um, we just kind of want to hear from you about, you know, what you know and why you're here. Hi, I'll start. Um, Brittany Price here. I'm a... Uh, PhD candidate in the Department of Earth, Atmosphere and Environment. And throughout the course of this year, I've been teaching, um, I've been the lecturer for introduction, uh, introduction to geology. So I've been utilizing an open source textbook for that course for my students. Excellent. And uh, in this upcoming fall, I've been approached to potentially teach a new to me course, um, geophysics in the department. And so I just wanted to kind of start preparing myself and my course materials. And I thought, you know, it, it's so much better to have uh, accessibility and reduce barriers for our students if we can go open access. So that's what brought me here today. That's great. It's so exciting to, to hear that, that one, you're already doing this, but you're also looking forward to, to doing more of this in, in the fall. Um, we'll sort of ask you later if you're planning to, um, or if you've already sort of indicated that this um, is a no, low or no cost course um, in my NIU, but we can kind of talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but thank you so much for, for sharing. Um, any of our other participants, can you want to tell us about why you're here and what you know about OER or Open? There. Hello, can you hear me? And can you yes, see me? Yes, I can. 
Yes. Okay. I kind of I kind of stepped out for a minute there. I had a student pop in. So, I'm, am I introducing myself? Yes. Okay. Okay. And tell us what. Tell us and tell us why sorry. you're here and what you know about OER. Okay. Sorry. Students first, right? And they pop in. You got it. You got it. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So um, I'm Linda Saborio and I'm in a world languages and cultures. Um, I don't know a lot about OER. Um, I do know that um, a colleague of mine in the department um, worked with the task force that put together um, information for the um, low and um, no cost option. Um, and I'm here to learn out, to learn more because I do know that uh, my students um, struggle to pay for the materials um, necessary for the class. And um, I'm going to be offering a course on um, Mexican literature, culture, and film in the spring mm. and um, having trouble finding materials that I can use in my class. So thank you very much. It's 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 great to kind of hear. I know we know that um, that some folks in world languages are kind of working on on these issues, and and there are some specific complications sometimes um, for you know trying to find materials that are not in English, um, and so this is something we can kind of talk about a little bit later, um, and as well as as you're kind of talking about trying to find uh, different kinds of formats, and and sometimes you know depending on your area, there's lots of materials. Sometimes you have to kind of uh, sort of piece things together, um, but one of the things we'll also be talking about today is how to use library resources and kind of how to reach out to your subject specialist to potentially get you in touch with the materials that you need. Um, so hopefully we can talk a little bit about that. Um, I see that Jacob put in the chat um, about being um, a PhD student in chemistry and it's been a little while um, since you've been a research assistant and, um, and haven't been kind of teaching in a bit um, but are interested in and in kind of maybe kind of looking at OER and using those in the future. And so we kind of have people uh, a kind of across the spectrum, um, which is which is often what we have, that everybody are in a different place in the continuum. And so we're going to try and kind of talk through some of the, the issues about how you can potentially um, adopt an open educational resource or how you can use low cost materials from the library. And so that's kind of what we'll be doing today. We'll also have an opportunity a little bit later on to do some searching. Um, so you can kind of use some of the resources that we've kind of curated to see if you can find things. Um, and you're, it's often pretty surprising how quickly you can find at least some things that, that cover some of your needs. Um, so that's kind of what we'll be doing. Um, before we kind of get into those other parts, I want to kind of talk a little bit about um, open educational resources for those of you who are less familiar with them. Um, and so as you probably know, um, and uh, you've probably sort of explored this a little bit yourself, there are a lot of materials that are free out there. Um, and so here in the library, we often kind of create in-house tutorials, uh, we make infographics, um, we do a lot of things um, that we can share with our patrons, we also use resources that other people create, like um, free YouTube videos. Um, and so faculty kind of routinely, routinely use um, like classic legal texts that you can find in um, Project Gutenberg um, or information from the US Geological Survey um, or streaming videos in languages other than English as part of their course materials. Um, and these are all potentially free, but they're not necessarily open. Um, and so we wanted to kind of talk about the difference. And so not all free sources are open, but all open educational resources are free. Um, and so when we're talking about open educational resources, we're referring to resources, tools, and practices that are free of legal, financial, and technical barriers and can be fully used, shared, and adapted in a digital environment. And so what makes the resource open is the license the creator um, or copyright holder gives you to use it, share it, transform it, basically um, allowing you to kind of adapt it so it meets your particular needs. And so probably I don't have to ask why affordable um, since some of these things have already come up, um, but it's pretty clear um, if you have sort of read the news, if you have sort of talked to students, um, if you kind of go over to the bookstore and see how many of the books for your particular course have been purchased, um, that course materials affordability has a profound effect on our students. And, you know, there's serious repercussions for our students here um, that not everybody does know about. Um, so as the infographic shows, the vast majority of NIU undergrads, and I should also add grad students, um, rely on financial aid. Um, and we have some, um, some grad students um, here in, in the room, and, and this may be true of you as well. 
Um, most work at least part-time to make ends meet. Some work full-time, some work multiple full-time jobs actually, as well as going to school. And so the average cost of textbooks and supplies per year at NIU totals about $1,400. Um, and that of course is an average, um, but that $1,400 puts us about $200 above the national average. And financial aid um, frequently doesn't even co cover the cost of tuition, let alone provide money for room and board or textbooks or other course materials. And so based on the current minimum wage, a student would have to work 127 hours just to pay for their textbooks. And, and I'm, we're giving that figure, but of course, this is not sort of taking into account taxes and all of that other. So if we're just saying, if you got all of the money that you earned from the minimum wage, it would take 127 hours. Um, and one of the other kind of complications that we have is that students are being put in the position frequently of having to choose between food and textbooks. Um, Food insecurity was an issue at NIU before the pandemic, and it's only been exacerbated. It's exacerbated further by sort of the inflation that we're facing right now. Um, and so obviously, if there's a choice between a book and a meal, um, people are often going to choose a meal. Um, and we don't want to make them sort of have to make those choices. Um, faculty members at NIU and campuses across the country have been trying to address some of these these issues um, because it's not only important to you know to ensure the sort of um, health and well-being of the student, but we also want people to be able to succeed. And if you're not buying the textbook, it's pretty hard to succeed. Um, and so we know a lot of people have been doing this work, but what was unclear is who exactly was doing it and what more still needs to be done. So this was actually kind of the genesis of the Course Materials Affordability Task Force that formed last year. Um, you may remember completing the Affordable Course Materials Survey in spring 2021. Um, that was the initial project of the task force. Um, and so we'll put a link to the, to the survey in the chat. Um, one of the things that's kind of remarkable is that we discovered that over 98% of our respondents um, reported that they'd recently taught a course with no or low cost materials. Um, we had no idea this was happening. And so it was actually a really good idea to ask. What we also discovered is that 98 out of 112 faculty members who recently taught um, with no or lo low cost materials responded that they were satisfied with these low or no cost resources, um, with the majority of folks indicating that they faced few or no challenges when it came to a finding, a pr finding appropriate ma material for their courses. And we can kind of talk a little bit later about um, what challenges, if any, people um, ha have kind of come, have come across when they've tried to, to kind of find these low and no cost materials. So as we can kind of see, um, many NIU faculty already use and are satisfied with um, affordable course materials. And of course, students are satisfied too, not only because textbooks no longer break the bank, um, but also because being able to afford the required text means that you're positioned to succeed in a way that you're not if you can't afford the text. And so this movement toward um, adoption, um, adaptation, and creation of low and no cost materials is advancing pretty rapidly. Okay, so that's why I had to click all the buttons to, to show my video and unmute myself. So there's actually been a lot of um, legislative activity in, in recent years um, towards zero uh, textbook cost initiatives. Um, one thing that a lot of states are doing is that they are passing legislation to require schools to um, label courses in their schedule as no cost material courses. Um, here in Illinois, we don't have that legislative requirement, but both the College of Lake County are, is doing it and um, McHenry County College also. And now NIU, we, at NIU, we do it as well. So an email went out to faculty, department chairs, and course schedulers before spring break, notifying that there are new um, attributes in my NIU so that information about courses with low or zero cost um, course materials is available to students at the time of registration. So we're defining course materials as required books, textbooks, ebooks, streaming video, CDs, and DVDs. Um, and we're really excited about this because it's going to facilitate reporting, assessment, and promotion of course materials affordability. 
So that means starting uh, for summer 2022, students can search for low cost or zero cost um, course materials courses. Uh, low cost ref will refer to a total course materials cost of $40 or less. And they can um, apply filters to class searches, as you can see here on the left side screenshot. Um, and students can also search by keyword um, to see all eligible courses um, as that are deemed low cost or zero cost as seen on the, the right. So um, department schedulers are being trained. So that's great. They're, they've received um, PowerPoints and information about how to um, assign those attributes in MyNIU. But because departments schedule, do their um, course schedules differently, it's really the responsibility of faculty and instructors to let their department chairs and or course schedulers know that those attributes should be applied to their courses. Um, so currently, um, we checked, I think, last week. And so as of last week, there are already 133 courses designated as low or zero cost courses for the fall. And there are already 10 courses for the summer as well. If you would like more information or to view a frequently asked questions about this that we're continuing to grow as questions or issues arise, I'm going to drop this into the chat to link you to the page. And I'm also going to pause here for a moment to see um, what questions you have about um, what's happening on campus about course materials affordability. And also, if you have a course um, that you have designated as, as low or no cost, we'd like to hear about that too, or um, you know, of course, some courses in your department. I have a question that's more of a curiosity thing. Um, is there a cap for a co like four courses as to how much cost materials can be for their course per semester? Like, uh, you know, limiting designated. Yeah, yeah. limiting uh, materials to I don't know, $500 or less? Or is there anything like that across the whole university? Um, as far as I know, there is not something a sort of cap at the high end uh, that it can't be more than a certain amount in order to be designated as um, low cost. Um, it needs to be under 40 um, per class. Um, but as far as I know, I don't know if um, Tracy or Larissa know, I don't believe that there is anything um, from the university that puts a cap on the high end about the maximum um, for a particular um, class. Not that I'm aware of. No, me either. And looking at some of the information we gathered, I can tell you it's above 500 if there is. <laughs> <laughs> yes, unfortunately, yes. that's right. Yeah. Yes, um, especially in you know in some of the the sciences. Um, some of the materials also um, because not just the text itself but sometimes there's the accompanying sort of online component um, which is often quite pricey as well um, and so um, one of the things that you know someone had said to us at some point well that you know this is an average that kind of fourteen hundred dollars and some are very low and some are very high um, and so it also varies from semester to semester how much you, you might be paying um, but as much as we can at least lower costs um, where we can um, maybe it sort of balances out the the ones that are on the high end and obviously we'd love to see everyone um, sort of adopt low, no and low cost um, but it is really more complicated in some disciplines Linda, you have your hand up. Hold on, you gotta find that button. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's always so the buttons. You gotta find the button. So if there's a course fee associated with a particular course, is that considered part of the cost of materials or is, are we just talking about the textbook only? Just the materials themselves. Just the materials themselves, okay. Yeah. And so for our lower level courses, as you may know, it's a four course sequence. And it's $130, but the same textbook is used all four semesters. So we can't, we have to indicate that there's a cost, right, for all four semesters, even though there technically isn't if they start with 101. 
you know, this, this actually came up during, um, with our task force, um, yeah. and, and, and your faculty, um, member Mandy, she actually did bring this up. And so right now, after discussing it in the task force, mm -hmm. um, the decision was made that, that you can't actually labels those as, as low cost, um, okay. because I can't remember the exact reasoning. I think it's because you can't necessarily because if they start with one or two, they have to purchase. Yeah. Right. right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 But if yeah. they go so into two or two, they it, the cost. Yeah, I'll have to ask her what the cost is for two or two. We might be able to indicate two or two is low cost. Yeah, and okay. and and it's really like that's sort of that was the initial decision made on that, but it, okay. you know maybe it, it's definitely something that that can be revisited. Okay. And then yeah. But yeah. yes, it, it's it's funny that exact that exact yes. um, example did come up. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and we'd actually spoken to people at other institutions who uh -huh. either who have this and and this was what they had decided that um, because you couldn't determine where someone was going to come into that sequence. This also is a, right. is the case in say nursing courses, um, and so they mm -hmm. have a very expensive book. But if you kind of could could uh, sort of prorate that <laughs> over those other courses, it might lower it down. Um, right. And so maybe there's something in the future we can look at some other kind of designation that says this book is required for these courses. And so if you've already purchased the book, you don't have to repurchase it. So maybe that's something we could look at in the future. Okay. Yeah. It, it's it, a little tricky, isn't it? But that, that, yeah. that works for me for now. And so yeah. any type of course fee then is not considered. Okay. That's good to know too. All right. Thank you. Yeah, and something maybe even further out into the future is having um, low cost or zero program costs programs, you know, and so that may be something where if your entire program, you know, maybe the program threshold was $200 or whatever, you know, um, but again, that's, that's kind of well in the future. Okay, because for example, also Cengage has a program where students pay um, one fee and have access to all the materials they need through Cengage. So it could be that they pay this one fee and then they will have access to maybe materials on there for several different courses. So they're getting quite creative, some of the publishing companies. Yeah, that's um, in, incl <laughs> inclusive access. Um, unfortunately, what what sometimes happens is, you know, if if it's a class, if if it's something that you're going to use over multiple semesters, you would still have to purchase that access each semester because normally um, the inclusive access only lasts for the for the term that you're in. Um, and so it's possible that if you have um, a bunch of of courses that are using Cengage or you know one of mm -hmm. the other publishers' materials, that it could be sort of cost effective but right. not necessarily, um, you know, over like a th throughout an entire academic year would it necessarily be. Right, but for that one semester it would be, okay. Right. I'm not thinking about, all right. Hmm. Any other questions, comments before we move on? And this is actually a good segue, I think. Um, moving on to perceived barriers and challenges, and one of those being like the ancillary materials that are provided by um, educational publishing companies. But um, as Deanna had mentioned, through our survey, we found out that most people who are already using low or zero cost course materials um, were really satisfied. But for those who did have some um, challenges, they did they noted these. Um, these challenges. So um, at the top of the list was finding relevant content. And so either um, content that really fit the course that was current or that was at the appropriate reading level. As I mentioned, those ancillary materials, that's something that um, is, is sort of hard to compete with right now for the educational um, publishing companies, um, especially you know the homework and the quizzes. Um, but one thing we wanted to mention is that um, this might be the case for some subject areas because many of the largest OER projects um, that have been funded over the last 15 years have really tried to target the high cost, high impact courses that save the most students the most money. So there um, tend to be more OER available today in for general education courses. So courses like psychology and biology and in calculus. 
So there are more resources to choose from for instructors who teach those introductory um, courses than for much more specialized topics, but that's certainly changing. Um, as this movement is growing, a, a lot more faculty are starting to develop um, more specialized course materials as well. In terms of ancillary materials, uh, it sort of is the same thing with the subject availability. Um, the focus over the last 15 years or so has really been on textbooks. So um, there are a lot more open textbooks and open textbook initiatives um, that exist today, but fewer options for those ancillary materials. You can certainly find um, lecture notes or, or course outlines or lesson plans online, and that's growing as well, but it's gonna be a lot harder to find um, you know, the homework in those test banks. Equally challenging, uh, according to some of our respondents, is this sense that it is um, time consuming to, to find the material. And so we're going to give you some time to explore OER resources in, in just a little bit. But I also wanted to mention, um, so we're hoping that that will demystify the process. But also, you know, we have subject specialist librarians that are ready and willing to help you identify potential um, OER that you could use in your courses or adapt to fit your courses. So there are, um, you know, there are resources out there. Quality is also something that can be a concern. So um, everyone was really wondering whether the quality for OER is any good, but studies have shown that when it comes to um, student learning, um, generally no cost materials are considered as good as or better than um, trad traditional textbooks. Students generally did better in classes using OER um, versus those in classes that were using traditional textbooks. Um, so ultimately, while the impact on student learning is the same or better than, but um, the impact on breaking down barriers of affordability and accessibility is really significant. And we have a slide of references at the end of this presentation. So we'd be happy to share um, those citations if you are interested in reading up on, on these studies. So as, as Larissa was sort of alluding to, um, one of the questions we hear more than anything else is, you know, are they any good? Um, and faculty are often concerned about, um, about the quality because commercial and scholarly publishing has a long track record and sort of inbuilt systems um, of kind of peer review um, to ensure quality um, control. Um, but of course, you know, we've probably all experienced this. Um, even a text that is published by a publisher with a reputation for quality doesn't mean every single title they publish is high quality. Um, I will mention that there was a, a, a supposed high quality publisher um, who, who kind of produced a book recently that were all throughout the word university was misspelled. Um, and, you know, obviously this is a kind of, you know, goof that happens, but, you know, that's that's something you probably probably want to kind of attend to, um, and so when we're actually talking about um, uh, about OER or textbooks in general, it's never really a, a one size fits all. Um, OER can vary in quality, um, just like a commercially published book. Um, so it's really important for faculty to do sort of due diligence um, whenever you're considering adopting a text. Um, I should also say um, that we were kind of having a conversation about, about this the other day and about people's concerns about quality. Um, the thing to remember is it's your colleagues who are actually creating these materials. It's almost always instructors and faculty members from universities who are making these texts. Um, so it's, you know, it's the, it's the people that you rely on um, to get to do, to kind of produce the scholarship in your field. Um, so hopefully if we rely on them for that, we can also kind rely on them for kind of building these sort of texts. Um, so we also want to kind of pause for a second um, about any sort of questions, any sorts of concerns that you have about, um, um, about transitioning to zero cost materials. Anything that you want to bring up about, you know, about do we feel good about making, making this change and um, you know, do we feel like it's going to be comparable in quality?
Okay. Um, so let's kind of move on to the next slide. Um, one of the things that's that's really important, as we said, I mean, with any kind of text that you're you're thinking about using, um, is that you want to really sort of spend some time determining whether it's you know it's good quality and whether it's a good fit. Um, and so one of the things that that people may not know is that many OERs have actually gone through a kind of system of peer review. Um, so specialists read, um, review, share those reviews to um, sort of prospective adopters so you can kind of benefit from their expertise. Um, peer reviewers are actually really vocal about any deficiencies. They're not afraid to say, um, you need to fix this, or this isn't accurate, or this needs editing. Um, and so because of that, um, the, there is this this sort of real kind of communication that's happening between the reviewers and the writers of these texts. Um, the vast majority, however, of open textbooks, um, those kind of re reviews are really positive. And there are actually some very good things about this sort of back and forth as part of the process of OER, um, is that unlike with commercial publishing, where you have to wait to address any sort of problems that show up until the next printing, if there is one, um, when you're talking about open educational resources, the original author of this could actually fix something immediately. If there is a kind of typo with a wrong date or there's something in a data set that's not correct, um, this can be fixed, you know, ASAP. Um, and so that means that you don't have to wait until later um, to, 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 to sort of um, engage with any of those changes. Um, so one of the things that we want to kind of share with you is this um, sort of checklist. Um, and so um, we're actually going to give you the link to this as well. Um, but the idea is that you want to ask yourself questions um, on this checklist to determine if a given text will work for you. So looking at quality, looking at appropriateness, looking at all the technical aspects um, to see if this is going to be a good fit. And this is something you can do um, as we're sort of looking at um, the resources in the next step of this process. Okay, so the, um, as we mentioned before, the idea of searching for OER can be somewhat intimidating. There's a, a sense that it is very time consuming. Um, most people start their search with um, Google, which can be super useful, but uh, I kind of think that starting with Google and um, getting uh, results for your search of, you know, 10 million results can be sort of intimidating and time consuming. So there are some other places that you can go to to find um, relevant sources. So you can use library license materials um, like ebooks or journal articles ac accessible through library databases. Um, we can also um, get streaming video uh, that we subscribe to. However, it's important that if you do um, search for library materials that you check with your subject specialist because, for example, um, ebooks are not always unlimited users. And uh, for the streaming video, those licenses are usually for one year. So if before you assign anything that you might find, you want to just check with your subject specialist to make sure that, um, you know, all of all students in your class can access it when you want them to. Um, another um, thing to note from the library is that while um, the move to no or low cost materials is sort of the most important and sustainable way to address course materials affordability, there are some stopgap measures that the library um, implements to, to help connect students to their materials. So for example, course reserves where um, you can place a copy of a required text either in the print course reserves collection, or you can request um, a digital reserve copy. Most, um, that's mostly for articles. And then we also have a, text, a textbook purchase recommendation program um, where the library will buy a required text um, or course resource for your course. Um, again, if it's something that's available in print or you want in print, that would then be placed on course reserve. Um, but we can also um, you know, purchase ebooks as well. Just note that if it's a print reserve book, then that's only for in use in the library and for a limited amount of time. And 
we don't have unlimited funds and requests have to meet specific criteria, but if it's possible, then we do try to, you know, use these short-term band-aids, we like to call them, um, to, to help support you and your students. There are also many, many repositories of free course materials out there that specifically cater to OER. And so the materials that you can really edit and reuse and remix um, to make it, you know, very relevant for your class. And you can find that on the free open and affordable resources libguide and I'm going to show you how to access that in just a moment. But before I do that, I just also want to mention again your subject specialist librarian and I'm going to um, drop in the chat actually a link to your the um, subject specialist librarian directory. If you don't know who your um, subject specialist librarian is, they are also a great resource that can help identify potential OER for your courses. So I'm going to just um, switch gears, stop sharing this so I can share my screen. So give me one moment. Okay, so um, we just want to make sure that you know where to go on the library's website here. So for um, to find library license materials, that's this middle section here. The first tab is Husky Search, which is our discovery tool and allows you to search for books, ebooks, um, articles, you know, videos. Uh, you can click on the drop down menu and you can check the library catalog to see if we um, at NIU already have access to a title that you're looking for or you know what titles are available for a specific subject. You can do um, an ebook search specifically or um, also article search, but you also can search for um, articles through our databases as well. And we have a listing for um, a resources by subject. So there's always a subject guide that identifies the specialized databases for that discipline. So you can um, search in those databases as well. Um, at the top here under services, there is a link to course reserves. So this will give you the information if you wanted to submit or make any course reserve requests for print and for electronic. And then um, Towards the, the middle section here is textbook affordability. And this is the link that's going to take you to our free, open, and affordable um, resources guide. And on the home page here, um, it includes that criteria for the textbook purchase recommendation program that we have that I had talked about. And there's also a link to the purchase recommendation form. Um, and you can submit those um, until until there's no more money. The most important page on, on this guide, I think, is the find no and low cost course materials. Let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger. There we go. And this is the curated list of resources for OER. So um, you can browse by format. The, the first tab here is for textbooks. Um, and this, this first section I think is really useful, the peer reviewed open textbooks. So these are all projects um, for OER textbooks that have gone through a peer review process. Um, I also really like Merlot, which is a great resource because it includes um, in, like, items in, in addition to textbooks. The other, um, tab I also want to make sure that I point out is the search multiple types all at once, which I find to be incredibly useful. I like OER Commons because you can search not just for textbooks, but also lots of other material and it'll search multiple resources at once. So this is um, useful as well. Any questions about where to find information? before we move on to um, letting you explore some of these resources. God, I'm glad you found it helpful. This is, this is a great resource and I will say that we are adding to it whenever we can, um, whenever we are aware of you know, additional resources out there or new projects 
that are available. So this is constantly being developed and updated. If there are no questions, then I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint. While Larissa is doing that, I do want to kind of point out if you if you actually found a great, um, you know, textbook or other open educational resource um, that you want to share with others, um, you can contact us um, and we will share that on um, on the guide. Um, so we're always looking for people to recommend um, resources to put on that guide. So now we'd like to give you um, about five minutes or so to explore um, one or two of these resources. I'm gonna drop, um, you can go to the guide now that you all know where that is. I'm gonna drop links to sort of the first places I would go to. Um, and that includes the Open Textbook Library, OpenStax, Merlot, and OER Commons. So if you want to um, choose one of those, um, search for uh, a subject. Remember that there are more resources for sort of introductory level subject courses, so not super, super specific topics. Um, so keep that in mind when you're searching. And then, you know, some things to consider are like how many, what are the number of results that you got, or does it seem like there is lots of available? Um, did you see any reviews that were available or any ancillary materials? Did it look like it, it could be um, useful that way? So we'll give you about three to three to five minutes for that. And then um, we'd love to hear how that process went for you um, before we continue on.
So just another minute or so. So, okay, um, let's talk a little bit about what you found, um, what you didn't find. Um, please kind of unmute if you're comfortable doing that and kind of tell us a little bit about what specifically you searched for and what sort of came up and if you thought that these look like potentially um, valuable resources. Also feel free to add any thoughts into the chat. Sorry, I'm here. Um, That's all right. Screen. This is crazy. I don't know what's going on today. <laughs> um, I tried doing a search just for like a major author, like Isabel Allende, even though I just realized halfway through my search, I probably would not use her and I couldn't find anything. Am I having issues? Is anybody else <laughs> having any Probab problems here? Probably one of the reasons that um, she didn't come up is because um, her material probably would be copyrighted. Um, and so something that's kind of more kind of broad, um, frequently when you're kind of doing searches in for OER, um, so okay. if you had sort of, you know, Spanish language literature you're more likely to kind of come across and it may be that um, Allende shows up in a text um, but wouldn't show up in that initial search so sometimes that's it's kind of about the way things are sort of keyed in so oh. that may be a strategy kind of going for a little bit more broad in general um, and then sort of digging deeper once you kind of get some hits so that's that's something I might suggest if um, Larissa do you have any suggestions okay so I might be looking at a textbook instead of... yeah Oh, that yeah, might not work. Yeah. Okay. All right. I will try that though for Mexican okay. Lit. Thank you. Yeah. Right. I think those those first um, resources that I posted in the chat those are mainly for textbooks, but there are other those other resources also might be um, a better fit. Or uh, you know, um, if you're looking for readings, I mean, it's going to be hard with copyrighted material. Yeah. That's the only thing. And so we were, you know, we've we've talked about this with other faculty that teach more current literature as well, that um, that's going to be hard to find um, free and open. Yeah, sometimes if you say if you have a piece of short fiction um, by the author, um, yeah. that is something that you can say, you know, find in an, in an anthology someplace and it sort of falls under fair use. So that you're not kind of using more than 10% of a total. Um, and so that's something that could potentially be scanned by the library and uploaded into Blackboard for you. Um, okay. some, sometimes too, for sort of older works, um, older editions of works, sometimes those do fall out of copyright, probably not so much for a and a um you know too still too recent for that to be the case but sometimes they show up and say project gutenberg um that's a really good place to go for um for fiction um so that's that's possibility um but again it's it is it is much more complicated for say a living author um to find materials that are open and so sometimes what you again what you'll find is even if it, if it, you sometimes you'll have an entire novel that's in an anthology um and um as long as it's sort of around between 10 and 20 percent of the total um that is something that could be potentially scanned and, and shared with your students yeah i've always told my students it's easier to work with dead authors so that makes sense. sadly <laughs> yes <Yeah>. unfortunately <laughs> they can't comment on their own yeah. work 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and, but, but of course, if you're looking at, if you're interested in say, looking at some kind of critical appraisals, scholarship on, on a particular author, those you usually can find um, because they are shorter in nature. And so that's something that you can, you can share, but yes, the, the pesky problems of copyright. <laughs> um, we actually do have some um, authors now who are starting to make their materials more openly available, but there's mm -hmm. also the, there's, there are still the kind of, intellectual property sort of concerns that obviously you want to be you know reimbursed yeah. for for your intellectual labor right. um so so it's it's a little bit tricky but um but there are some authors now who are who are interested in doing that and sometimes uh, i know that faculty have reached out to a living author and said would you be willing to kind of share this in a form just with my students um and sometimes that happens hmm. okay but yeah it, it is it is complicated yeah, it is a little bit, huh? Okay, thank you. Other kind of um, other things that people noticed as you were kind of searching, um, going through this process? Did you kind of find a lot? Did you find nothing at all? Did you find reviews? Did you find these ancillary materials? As Larissa pointed out, especially if you're looking for more kind of introductory sort of gateway courses, your you know materials that are associated with those, you're more likely um, to find things than if you're say using upper division or graduate level sometimes. Okay, so more material on geophysics rather than than full textbooks. Interesting. Um, if you don't mind saying, uh, Brittany, where were where were you searching? Did you try all of these, or was there one in particular? Um, I tried a couple of them. I tried the Merlot, I tried the CNX, and I tried the ORE Commons. And and one of the things that's sort of um, sort of interesting is that some of these you'll have text that kind of overlap and you'll see in these multiple kind of repositories. Um, but some some of them are kind of better for specific kinds of material. So there are ones that are a little bit more sort of, you know, physical ones that are you know more humanities based yeah absolutely and so sometimes it's sort of kind of playing around with these a little bit to, to see what's available and the, the other thing that's important to remember is this changes all the time that new materials are being uploaded every single day and so looking today um, you may not get the same results that you get a week from now or a month from now and so it's it's always sort of growing and so like for instance um, here in illinois um, the consortium of academic research um, libraries in, in illinois um, got a grant um, to fund people to create um, open educational resources and so they're doing that currently so um, a year, a year and a half from now, there will be, you know, up to, you know, you know, more than a half a dozen uh, materials um, that um, will be available to, to everyone that are not available right now. And so um, it's it's slightly frustrating because sometimes it's it's not it's all where you want it, um, but it is something that's growing, as I said, all the time. We're sort of running short on time, so I want to make sure we actually have a moment to kind of um, give you an opportunity to tell us what you need. Um, we really want to see, you know, what supports or resources would you like um, to help you transition to low or zero cost materials? I mean, some of you are already kind of doing this or in the process um, for it, but um, what can we do to help you? We want to, to provide resources that are going to make this as painless as possible. So do you have any ideas for us? I personally think that, uh, you know, the information you shared between the um, the links in the chat bar and in the PowerPoint are a wonderful resource and starting point to looking. Um, I'm like even just seeing all the um, all the course materials that others have uploaded to these these different databases is, is quite impressive. And I'm I'm excited that I'm going to have an opportunity to, you know, build a course you know, that's much more fair for our students. 
That's great to hear. I mean, we 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 are trying to kind of grow this and 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 meet everyone's needs. So we're happy that it's that it's a good kind of jumping off point. Um, Tracy put in the chat about talking to your subject specialist librarian. That is a really good idea. Um, so because you can say I'm looking for something really specific that I haven't found yet, and so you know the two of you could kind of work together on trying to find exactly what you're looking for. And the thing is about about open educational resources too. Sometimes it's there is not a a, a single text that meets all the needs, but because they're OER, you can pick and choose and use the things that, that actually will meet your needs. And so you could do a kind of blend of bits and pieces from some textbooks, um, some articles that, um, that you can access because the library has licenses for you to access those materials. And so um, one of the things that's really great and something that we don't talk about enough when we're talking about um, this course materials affordability is it gives you so much more control um, because you get to make the course that you want, the text that you want, and you don't don't have to rely on a textbook publisher to tell you what you should be doing. And so you know your students, you know the needs of that particular course. Um, and so you can kind of blend those together in a, in a really exciting way and develop, you know, interesting pedagogy that kind of makes use of, of your students' knowledge. And so, um, yes, definitely reach out to Meredith. Any kind of last thoughts, um, anything else that you want to, to add? Any other kind of questions for us or things that you want us to know that we can take back to the task force and also kind of use as we're updating the um, the libguide? Well, thank you very much um, for for all these really great ideas, um, the great work that you're doing, and and kind of the how you're trying to kind of push this forward. Um, we want to you to feel comfortable kind of getting in touch with us if you have any questions. Um, and Larissa, do you have um, other things you want to say to kind of close us out? I think you've said it all. So thank you very much for coming, and um, please reach out to your subject specialist or if you have questions specifically for us, we'd be happy to share them as well. We're also happy to do um, these presentations, workshops in like a presentation format for faculty. So if, if you 